is National Fisherman Live. I'm Leslie Taylor. This week on our program, Michael Crowley, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, talks about an environmentally safe underwater ship hull coating system. And we take you to the floor of the Pacific Marine Expo for the Fisherman of the Year contest. But first, some fishing news from around the coasts. The so-called polar vortex that has millions shivering throughout the American heartland, not only at the cold but at the thought of their heating bills, is a delightful development for ice fishermen. In Maine, fishing camp operators have been able to drag their smelt shacks out onto the ice three to four weeks earlier than in a typical year. Like salmon, the small silvery smelts live their lives at sea but return to rivers to spawn. A week ago, camp operators spoke of having as much as 16 inches of ice. There has been a brief thaw since, but temperatures cooled back down. Enough Mainers enjoy smelt fishing to support quite a number of fishing camps. Fishermen rent a shack, drill through the ice, and wait for action in comfort, if sitting in a hut on the middle of a frozen, often windswept river is your idea of comfort. Still, despite the early freeze, business is off to a slow start, competing as it has been with the holiday season. But as we head into mid-January, business is certain to pick up, and as it does, Officer Matt Sinclair of the Maine Marine Patrol warns fishermen to be careful on the ice. Err on the side of caution, he says. Two more areas off the Oregon coast are now off limits to commercial and recreational fishing. As 2013 came to a close, marine reserves were implemented at Cascade Head, just north of Lincoln City, and at Cape Perpetua, south of Yahats. All fishing is prohibited inside the reserves, along with the taking of invertebrates, as well as seaweed and wildlife. Similar recreational and commercial prohibitions are in place on marine reserves at Redfish Rocks, south of Port Orford, and Otter Rock, between Depot Bay and Newport. In addition, areas near the two new reserves have been designated marine protected areas. Recreational fishing for salmon and crabs, as well as fishing from shore, will be permitted in the MPAs. Also in place are a marine protected area and a seabird protection area south of the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. Here the taking of bait fish, including Pacific herring, Pacific sardine, anchovies, smelt, and Pacific sand lance, is banned to protect the food base for the birds, but all other fishing is allowed. If that's not enough protection for you, a marine reserve in concert with a somewhat less restrictive marine protected area will be implemented at Cape Falcon beginning in January 2016. Jerry Fraser, publisher of National Fisherman, has some concerns about the effectiveness of marine protected areas. I think, I think marine protected areas, marine reserves sound good, but the question is how much good are they really doing? We know that they inflict pain on, on users of the resource, whether it's commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, or both. The question is, is there a commensurate benefit for the resource itself? Like so many conservation strategies, they sound good at first blush. I think the question is, though, what, is, what are the real impacts and what are the real benefits? Um, I think it's very important if you're going to do these things that you monitor them for a benefit for a larger body of fish. But is, it, is there a larger biomass of fish outside of this small area that's growing because of it? If, if, if it's just a local benefit, um, then I, I'm a little skeptical of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the marine reserve as a cure-all. The holidays mean festive decorations, exchanging gifts, and spending time with family. But Thanksgiving and Christmas also mean an increased demand for oysters, which generally leads to a spike in oyster poaching. This year, using new technologies and enforcing harsher penalties, Maryland enforcement officials are cracking down on illegal oyster harvesting in the Chesapeake Bay. Poaching includes harvesting undersized oysters, exceeding bushel limits, or harvesting in areas designated as sanctuaries. Maryland Natural Resources Police are equipped with laptops and radar that work 24-7 to monitor commercial fishing practices. They also have begun utilizing a helicopter equipped with a nose camera that can zoom in on poachers from distances of 8 to 10 miles away, even at night. And if poachers are caught, they face not just a fine, but immediate and permanent loss of their oyster harvesting licenses. It's too costly to do wrong, John Willie Dean, president of the St. Mary's Waterman's Association, told Capital News Service. In Alaska, Lieutenant Governor Mead Treadwell has rejected a proposed initiative that sought to ban commercial shore gill nets and set nets in non-subsistence areas. The proposal, billed as a conservation effort, is only the latest in the ongoing battle between commercial fishing and proponents of sport and personal use fishing. While written to apply statewide, a review of the proposal said it was more targeted and would affect only the set net commercial salmon fishery in Cook Inlet, a fishery that competes with personal use salmon fisheries in the Kenai and Castle Off rivers. 
Supporters of the proposal were seeking to move to the signature gathering process to qualify the proposal for the ballot. But a review of the proposal said it would significantly undermine a constitutional ban on so-called appropriation by initiative. Were this type of initiative permissible, voters could continue to reallocate stocks to any fishery simply by eliminating specific gear or particular means and methods of catching fish in order to increase harvest opportunity for other types of users, the review states. Jessica Hathaway, editor-in-chief of National Fishermen, explains the political tensions between the opposing interests. This most recent initiative was filed by the Alaska Fisheries Conservation Alliance, backed by Bob Penny, and it was essentially um, a claim for conservation. And like many set net ban initiatives <laughs> and many gear ban initiatives, it really was an effort to reallocate quota as opposed to conserve quota. And essentially it was taking advantage of all of the bad press around low stock numbers for king salmon around the state of Alaska. Um, however, where the ban would be taking place, kings are not a stock of concern under the state's um, management. So essentially it would be banning an entire gear set of commercial fishermen in favor of recreational fishermen. I think it's important to note that the Kenai Area Fishermen's Coalition is um, an unguided angler group and they filed a paper um, opposing this initiative. So all of the sport fishing interests are not aligned behind this initiative at all. Dwindling rains, a stubborn drought, and more demand for water upriver in Austin have taken a toll on the crabs, shrimp, oysters, and fish that provide livelihoods for coastal communities along Texas' Matagorda Bay, an estuary fed largely by the Colorado River. We're in bad shape, Buddy Treibig, who's been shrimping the bay for more than 30 years, told ReportingTexas.com. The shrimp and oysters are almost gone. The big boats have quit fishing the bay entirely. Texas has been plagued by droughts since 1996. The state has dedicated $2 billion for water infrastructure improvements, but most projects are years away. The Lower Colorado River Authority says that inflows into the bay over the past five years have been the lowest of any five-year period in recorded history, eclipsing even the historic drought of the 1950s. The Colorado supplies the bay with nutrients that feed shrimp larvae, blue crabs, fish and clams that mature in the shallow estuary waters. The river also moderates the bay's salinity. Even so, the drought led officials to propose halting the release of fresh lake water into the Matagorda Bay, a measure that was averted by heavy October rains. Treybig is a self-appointed defender of the bay and an advocate for people who depend on it to make a living. A local Chamber of Commerce official called him our go-to expert, the very best at observing changes in the bays and estuaries. Treybig says he doesn't want his 20-year-old son to become a shrimper. There's no future in it, he says. And now, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, Michael Crowley, with product news. I'm Michael Crowley. I'm National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, one of our products. And each month, National Fisherman highlights two new products. By new products, we mean anything introduced within the past several months. But we are also looking for products that though they might have been used for some other, in some other sectors of the marine industry, are new to commercial fishing. Such a product was Hydrex's Echo Speed, which has been and is being used on minesweepers, naval boats, ocean-going uh, ships, and icebreakers. But it hasn't been marketed to the commercial fishing industry, at least until National Fishermen ran a product story on it in our June 2013 issue. Echo Speed is a bottom paint that will last the life of the hull, according to its manufacturers, though it's only guaranteed for 10 years, although that can be renewed. It's a non-toxic vinyl ester resin coating with embedded glass platelets, which gives it its longevity and toughness. Now what about that non-toxic aspect? That means it has to be cleaned more frequently than regular bottom paints to keep the hull from being contaminated and fouled with, with growth. So here's the second feature. Besides the forever longevity, 
The boat doesn't have to be hauled to be, have the bottom painted. Divers with mechanically powered carbon fiber brushes can clean the hull. And Hydrex will fly to wherever your boat is and clean, <coughs> and clean the hull. Or they will also sell you the equipment and teach, you, teach your crew how to clean the hull. So if you're in Dutch Harbor, and you don't want to go to Seattle to have the hull cleaned, or you're a scalloper in New Bedford, and you don't want to spend the time uh, waiting for a travel lift or a ways to be cleared to be hauled, then Hydrex just might be the product uh, that you're looking for. Thanks, Mike. Next, a look at the 2013 Fisherman of the Year contest held at the Pacific Marine Expo in Seattle. Mark, get set, go. Each year at the Pacific Marine Expo in Seattle, there is a contest for the coveted title, Fisherman of the Year. Participants engage in a series of fishing skill tests. From net mending to splicing to blindfolded knot tying, the competition is fierce. Next one. Yep. Next one. Yep. Don't forget to raise your hands when you double your third knot. You got to raise your hands. Hey, what's up? Hold on. Oh, yeah. We got one. We got two. Check the splice to make sure it's okay. If it's not, the next guy will be the winner. So keep splicing. Hold your hands up when you're done. Cash prizes are awarded to the winners of each event, and finalists advance to the competitive survival suit round. Winner of this one's going to get another hundred. Yeah, they're they're going to get a brand new survival suit, and they're going to get a jacket just like this one. You'd be the most popular guy on the dock, no question about it. In the 2013 finals of the Fisherman of the Year contest, Reed Tenclay of Portland, Oregon, defeated Chris Guggenbickler from Wrangell, Alaska, in the survival suit competition to earn top prize. Yo, we're seeing two different techniques here, some techniques for this. Do you have what it takes to be next year's winner? For more commercial fishing news and analysis, subscribe to National Fisherman Magazine, visit our website at www.nationalfisherman.com, or subscribe to our twice-weekly e-newsletter. For National Fisherman Live, I'm Leslie Taylor.